My name's Claire Collins and I'm a Laureate Professor in Nutrition and Dietetics at the University of Newcastle. I'm also the Director of the Food and Nutrition Research Program for Hunter Medical Research Institute and importantly I'm an NHMRC Senior Research Fellow. Nutrition science is fundamental but what's tragic is that there's a lot that we know right now but it doesn't find its way to the consumers. So it's very important for clinicians to stay up to date with cutting edge nutrition science, but it's even more important that we work with communication organisations to get that information reliably to the general public. It's very hard if you're a patient or a consumer and you want to know, oh, what's the best diet for arthritis? Or is there any problem with me being a vegan or making my children vegan? Well, if you go onto social media, you are going to get so confused because there's an array of information and misinformation. So knowing where to go to get accurate and reliable information to allow yourself as a clinician, but to allow people to make evidence-informed decisions about dietary patterns they may or may not want to try or what the risks and benefits are is really, really important. One of the key things as a health professional who might be seeing someone who's interested in following a really specific dietary pattern, and let's focus on veganism, is that there are health risks associated with that. If somebody wants to try being a vegan, then they really do need to do it properly, otherwise there's a range of things that can go wrong. And somebody like that, it would be good to start off with a blood test, particularly to check their iron status. Uh, depending on their life stage, you might want to check their iodine status as well. If it's age appropriate, you want to be checking their bone density because being a vegan and even being a vegetarian, in fact, is associated with a lower bone mineral density and more likely to have osteopenia or osteoporosis, in, in fact. So let's just take those one by one. So someone walks in the door, hi doc, I'm going to be a vegan. Well, that can be a healthier dietary pattern, but the first up nutrient to discuss with them is iron because it's only really good sources are found in meat products. If you're going to be relying on plant-based sources of iron, then that requires the person to be really on the ball to make sure at the same meal they have a food rich in vitamin C. That's things like salad, capsicums and fruit. Um, the next nutrient that is of a particular concern is iodine. Now, if, th if this was a young woman at the life stage where they could have children, then it really is worth checking their thyroid function and making sure they're aware of how to include good sources of iodine in their diet. And the reason for that is because um, in, in Australia in particular, we do have cases of iodine deficiency, and that's why iodine is added to salt used in bread making flour here. But of course, if they have a low iodine status while pregnant, that can affect the baby brain development. And I, in fact, would recommend that they take an iodine supplement right through to the end of pregnancy and while they're breastfeeding. The other nu nutrient um, I mentioned at the start was calcium. If this is an adolescent, study shows that vegetarian and vegan adolescents do not reach peak bone mass when they're following plant-based diets. So in this case, potentially you'll need to judge it knowing what their bone density is relative to the population norm and it's likely you may need to recommend a calcium supplement. Calcium is in some of the plant-based milks but one of the challenges is you need to look at the label because it's not necessarily just like getting the same amount of calcium if you were drinking a cow milk. As part of that screening blood test you might do when they walk in the door, definitely check their B12 status. Vitamin B12, cobalamin, is only found in animal products. It's actually in plant products as a contaminant, and, uh, and that particularly in mushrooms, so products that might have some sort of contact with, the, with, with soil, but not all mushrooms do, and it is in some seaweeds. But you can get vitamin B12 in some of the fortified plant milks, and there are some particular food products like, believe it or not, reduced salt Vegemite actually contains vitamin B12. This is really important in order to avoid B12 deficiency and, uh, and the anemia that's associated with, with that if the person becomes deficient. I think being on the front foot 
with all of those nutrients will allow your patient to test their nutrition related health and well-being. I would bring them back after a few months and check in on how they're going and evaluate where any, any particular tests need repeating. Trying to counter misinformation in social media is really important. You can't put your head in the sand and pretend it's not there just because you don't happen to be on Instagram. This is key area where people get a lot of information and it's not always evidence-based. You know, sometimes it is. So I think as a, as a health professional, it's important for you to be knowledgeable on what the trends are. So whether that's veganism or, you know, people wanting to use pink Himalayan salt, being able to respond to a client or a patient or a customer with evidence-based information and knowing where to go for more information that's sound, that's a meaningful way that you can really help them. It doesn't help if you just tell them, you know, they're silly or, you know, don't, don't dare try that. I like to take the approach of going, well, what is the evidence on this topic? And if there are some risks, what would you need to do? What would that person need to do in order to optimize their health and well-being while they're trying to be a vegan or why they're trying to test out this particular supplement? Knowing the risks versus the benefits that will keep them engaged in your health care rather than send them out the door going, well, I'm never going to speak to that health professional ever again because they don't listen to me. I think it's helpful to also be aware of some of those very high level marketing activities that really are pushing unhealthy food and the use of supplements in our food supply. The supplement market itself is worth billions of dollars and the majority of those are not needed by the general population. You know, there are specific examples of where people absolutely do need a particular supplement for a health condition, but that's totally disproportionate to the number that are on the market, many of which have no evidence at all. So as a health professional and a clinician, it's good to be a, a bit cynical about the need for these, but it's also important to be aware of what's being pushed on people, you know, for their arthritis or for their pain or for any reason in particular. Some of those supplements are driven by that supplement market itself, but many of the foods are driven by big food who, you know, let's face it, they stand to make money if people become addicted to their food products. Above all of that though, you do need to know where to direct people to evidence-based information. Globally, people can access information via The Conversation, which is a free public website that's a collaboration between academics and journalists to translate evidence-based information into readable, practical, usable advice. And why it's really good is because if something is topical, you'll find an article about it on The Conversation and likely in your own country without having to come to the Australian website or the US or the UK. So this is, this is very, very practical. The way I address this in my research is that I created a website called No Money, No Time, and we synthesize research, nutrition research evidence specifically, into bite-sized short reads and also link that to recipes so that people can really use the nutrition science they're not waiting years and years and years for that translation uh, in, into advice on what to eat for health. So I've been a dietitian for over 40 years and when I first started my career, if we really wanted to know about the nutrients that somebody consumed, you basically had to block out about half a day to take a thorough diet history and then get out the book of nutrient contents of foods get out your graph paper and your calculator to work it out. In my research, I've been able to create some cutting edge tools that can essentially replace that dietary assessment and undertake that analysis within 15 minutes. But I know that that won't be the end of it, that the future of nutrition science and the ability to feed back to people detailed information about their dietary patterns is going to accelerate and progress in the future. That's the research that I'm doing in precision and personalized nutrition. And it's very important that the underlying science that considers your genetics, how well your particular genes allow you to digest, absorb food, and what your nutrient requirements are, how your body responds to particular dietary interventions, 
it's very important that that science very quickly gets to market and gets to being able to use by clinicians, by dietitians, by GPs. So some of the other aspects that I test in my research is how these technology tools that can really rapidly assess your diet, how do they relate to underlying biomarkers that appear in your blood or that appear in your urine? And how can those platforms be linked to primary care so that when you go to see your GP, your GP or your specialist doctor will be able to look at your results and say, oh, you finished that dietary trial. Here's your cholesterol, here's your diabetes markers, here's the other markers for monitoring your kidney function, and I can see you respond. Or just as important, I can see that you're a non-responder. The biomarkers tell me you adhered to that dietary pattern, but I can see that medically, to the medical health side, you're a non-responder, so I will adjust the medication like this or this. So this new approach and the trajectory of the changes will mean that in the future, nutrition-related healthcare and management will be better integrated into medical care, but even more important, it'll be more accessible for everyone as part of routine healthcare. <music>